you have been one of the singular uh, voices that have been critical of certain aspects of the music industry. Mm. And uh, I think people are aware that there's racism within the music industry, but they don't want to put their head about the parapet to uh, voice it uh, pu pu publicly. So tell me why you do it and probably why you differ from your other colleagues that I be mute. Well, I think first of all, you see, you see this, Ariwa? <laughs> Ariwa pays my salary. Sony don't pay my salary. Right? EMI don't pay my salary. And the average black man in the industry is being paid by, by some white company. So he's got to be careful what he says. He cannot get up and speak freely. In some ways, he's still a slave, because if he if he's too critical, next week he might be fired, or they might leave it a little while and six months to change him. Whereas I could honestly tell you how it feels, and I would tell anybody, put on a black skin for two weeks in this industry, and see see how different you're treated. You know, and the hurtful thing is, you're. Know, you know, a white guy could come into this, not be very good, and yet he's fast lane, he's on a fast track to success, right? And, you know, there's a term that we use called white privilege, you know? When a white man come into the black music industry, like he joined a white privilege club, which, you know, we don't have that club. You know, he could... You know, suddenly he's getting gigs. I mean, I see it. The other day I did an experiment with a guy. And, you know, I see the guy suddenly getting gigs left, right, and center. And we get it. And normally, if I do them same gigs with a black guy, I don't get the gigs. So I think everybody in the industry have to examine themselves. And there ought to be a test set by people like myself. And the basic test is... Am I a racist? And let, cer let certain people in the industry fill out that test. And at the end of the day, be honest and say, listen, it looks like I only get 40 points, you know. Maybe I need to really readjust certain things in myself, you know. Because just like how there is a slave within that don't want to be critical, because he don't want to go hungry. Just so there's a slave master. There's a slave master out there who looking for any chance to use black people, you know, and the commodity don't matter. It could have been sugar cane in the eighteenth century or rice or whatever. And it could have been music. But some black people are stupid. Some black people think when when white people like music you know, it's because they like black people. It's not to do with it. The most racist man in the world could come into this who don't like black people, but find that black black music could make him a million pounds in six months. And yeah, and he's the biggest champion for, for, for black music. But I think we suffer so much that whatever we make have got to go back into... Um, race relations and into like whether black companies or something and we always have to be careful because if not we find ourselves going wrong in circles which is what's going on Welcome back. Now, skinny white guys and their guitars. Not since the mid-90s has indie music so dominated the British music charts. There are no black British artists in the top ten singles or album charts, and they only received one Brit nomination this year. Such is the concern that the Black Music Congress met today to ask why. Is it because white artists have more successfully exploited new technology, or that the music industry is failing to nurture young black artists? <laughs> British black music is in a dire state and we need to be uh, awakened to that fact. The inherent problem has been there for a long time, i.e. lack of 
investment in, in British black music talent, yeah, the industry not engaging with them seriously. Often black artists are the first to, to go when things get tough. Years if we haven't got what it takes to keep going. You're always on the fringes with the the minor budgets, then you get to reap the minor rewards. Loose Ends made four albums between 1984 and 1988. They had hit records in the American charts, but never broke into the British top ten. Bands in the 80s, um, like Central Line, Light of the World, <clears throat> uh, their careers could have been a lot longer if there were more black people in the business at the time who understood black music. Even now, in the 1990s, there isn't that many people who understand black music from a natural standpoint uh, within the industry, which is kind of sad, because you know, we're making a lot of records every day and uh, they have to be understood by the people who are selling it. Britain is a multicultural society, but the public rarely gets the chance to hear black British music. Large record companies and the media control which music is promoted and played. They make hit records happen, they make superstars. Good to see some heavy rockets. Money for nothing. There are no black British superstars, but this does not reflect a lack of talent. It is just one symptom of the way the record industry champions white artists and their music. This is partly because it has so few black employees. I think it's very important for the in record industry itself to recognize that it is not special. And it has the same kind of problems with underemployment and underrepresentation of eth ethnic minorities as any other business. And it's also important that the public recognizes that the record industry is not special and is not a right on business, a, a very hip industry, which is an equal opportunity employer, because it manifestly is not. The record industry is worth £680 million a year and has around 50,000 employees. It was unable to give us figures on how many are black. I don't think it's just down to the employment of black people in, in the music business. I, I mean, I've over many years been involved with uh, black people in all spheres of uh, my career in the music business and I don't think that's been um, the reason why black music has not developed because there's not enough people in it. I think uh, there are all sorts of other outside uh, forces uh, that have caused that. But of course I'd like to see a lot more black music, uh, black people in the music business. Until there's more of us in the industry owning our own thing and having more of a say in it business-wise and what the decisions on, on the releases and, and the, the people who get the, the money, the budgets in the companies, then it's going to be, it's going to carry on like this. You know, people are going to come up and disappear and come up and disappear and it makes it appear as if we haven't got what it takes to keep going. People often go into a record company, not just with their music, but with a whole idea of image rather than an idea of who they are. This sort of doesn't help people whose music comes from a different place. In particular, it hasn't been helpful to younger black British musicians in the past few years because people in the record companies in charge of selling their product have not made the effort to understand the culture which produced that music. Britain has many gifted black soul singers, but it's the white British soul acts who gained greater fame. The great success of, of white British artists in playing black music can be attributed to the fact that perceptions of pop music are such that black music taken to radio is seen as being a marginal area. But when you get white acts playing the same type of music, all of a sudden the radio people and the media in general have to say, well, this is obviously popular. This is pop music. The song's good enough and the record's good enough, it should be getting played on the original. It shouldn't have to wait until a white act covers it before it gets media acceptance. The 
The best guide to who the record industry really honours is the prestigious BPI Awards. Soul to Soul were passed over for the Best Newcomer Award, which was given to Lisa Stansfield, a white singer of soul music. Rather than giving um, credit or respect, paying respects to the people that come up with an original idea, it's a bit like, right, now we've found a great white hope that can do this better than, or as well as they can, even if it's not as well as, but we can do something that's sort of like the real thing. Let's, let's market them and put a lot of money behind them rather than like sticking behind um, the people that are out there slogging for us right now and doing really well and bringing in the bucks. Well, that is so, so. The difficulty I think at the moment is that there's a very narrow band of people selecting what is the best pop music, which means that you do get underrepresentations of major areas of music because there's nobody in the Radio 1 production circles who really knows about them. You may be right, because obviously if, if there are people, if, we're not, if we haven't got the right mix of people, then that is going to reflect on what goes on. I, I would accept that. Now, you can't play a record um, on its merit if you don't have the understanding of the merit. You don't know where the record is credible. If you don't stand up in the dance hall and hear the record slam. If you don't, you know, and these are the people that are in the radio. If we could find presenters of what color, whatever color, race or creed, that were good and were up to our professional standards, then we would have them on the air, and I'm sure if we had a greater racial mix, we would have more, we would have a wider range of music on the network.